enough. 7.2 mil. By the way, did your mom throw away your baseball cards when you went to college? No. No, no. Really? I mean, I always Good had for them. you. I know. I had a couple of big boxes. I probably yeah. misplaced them, but I never heard of a Babe Ruth rookie card. I mean, everybody's heard of the Honus Wagner, but I, you know, I didn't That's hear of the 1914, Babe Ruth rookie card. right? Babe Ruth's so rookie season, that. 1914. I guess. Man. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, the Niners crush the Eagles. The Packers top the Chiefs, and Ohio State's quarterback enters the portal. But we begin today with a controversy over the playoff committee's Final Four. Undefeated ACC champion 13-0 Florida State was left out, while one loss Texas and Alabama were put in underneath Michigan and Washington, who are both undefeated conference champions just like Florida State. Wilbon, are these the choices you would have made? Yeah, Tony, probably. If I was voting, um, I think I would have wound up despite some real conflicts and some objections that I would have to get over on my own ballot, I think I would have voted for those four. I feel bad, genuinely bad for Florida State. Because, Tony, one of the lessons that football purports to teach, fraudulently, usually, is that you persevere and you play through your wounds and your injuries and you overcome, right? And you do all these yeah. things. That's what Florida State did. And the sport of football, yeah. with so many people say, oh, it's the greatest sport of all because it teaches all these lessons. It didn't teach you a damn thing. It lied. It lied to Florida State. The sport of football lied because Florida State did all the things it was required to do and then some and didn't get in. You know what I mean? Come right. on. They're the champions of a power five. It's not called the, yep. oh, the lesser of the power five, even though it may be. It's a power five conference, and Florida State was told to get away because they got injuries, as if there's no Lou Gehrig in this culture, as if there's no Tom Brady, two famous, famous, famous athletes in American history who got in as a result of injuries to someone in front of them. So football lied to them. It's sad. Yeah. Would I have voted the same way the committee did? Probably so. Yeah, so I like the fact that you accuse football of lying, but yeah. you concede that you would vote the exact same way. So you yep. would have lied to yep. Florida State. Me too. You personally me would too. have lied to Florida State. Yep. So I believe that there's there's one thing at play here. Do you want the best four teams or do you want the most deserving four teams? If you want the most deserving, Florida State should be in there. They are 13-0. and They won every single game that they had. They persevered, as you said, and they deserve to be in there. I'm going to go the other way, though, Mike. I mean, I believe that the ACC is not nearly as good a football conference as the SEC. I believe if Florida State was in the SEC, they would lose two or three games. I believe if they played Alabama five times, they would lose at least four games. So I'm okay with Alabama and Texas being in there because I, I actually think that they are better teams. I'm going to go over the bell because, because the great irony here, Mike, is that this all would never have happened if the guy who made the call on the defense of Auburn, on the last play of Auburn and Alabama, yeah, yeah. didn't make the stupidest, most fireable call in the world because they never went after Milrow. Yeah. They gave him time to stand there and calmly pick out a guy on a 31-yard touchdown pass. If they forced him out, yeah. Alabama would not have won that game. They would have two losses. Yeah. Florida State would be in this. And by the way, if Georgia had won... Yeah. Florida State would be in this because four unbeaten teams, the allure of that but let me would have made something. it possible for Florida. So you just took down the ACC. The committee then lied again because they voted Florida State based on its record in that ACC, which you find substandard. Number four it voted the them time. in the well, no. top four the whole winter. So what are we talking right. about? I don't find it substandard, Mike. I find it not as good as the SEC or the Big Ten. And by the way, most years, we're talking about not even having three teams you want to yeah, see. That's true. And we certainly never have 12, but this year we had eight. And Mike, it was if you took Oregon and Florida State and Georgia and Ohio State, who were number one for almost the entire year, and put them against the four that are in, they may win three of the yeah, four. That's, it's that's, conceivable that's, to it's, me. It's conceivable. But I, what I'm saying to you is I think everybody takes the easy route and says how sad they feel for Florida State, that's fine. But I think the best four got in, and mm. so do you. I don't know about the best four. I'm not saying that. You and Herbie the can right go with four. the best four. You I don't know what that right means. Four. It's subjective. You said the right You said it's you would do it. It's the four I would have voted for. It doesn't mean it's okay. right. The and it doesn't mean they're the best. I'm glad, I'm glad you grand poobahs know that. I'm glad you do.
Yeah, they have the best four. Let's move That's to right. the NFL. I stand by that. And the Niners' definitive win over the Eagles. Francisco. That's the best team today. Today. I'm not saying it's the best team in five weeks. That's the best team in the NFL today. They have four people who can score from anywhere on the field. They have Samuel. They have McCaffrey. They have Kittle. They have Ayuk. Anywhere on the field. They have statistically the best quarterback in the league today. Brock Purdy is the best. Yep. And they go out and they beat people. Mike, they beat Dallas 42 to 10. Let me get the numbers here. They went to Jacksonville. They beat Jacksonville, a playoff team, 34 to 3. They went to Philadelphia. They beat Philadelphia 42 to 19. The teams that they have played have a winning percentage of 531, whereas the teams that Philadelphia has played, 497. Dallas, not even on the board, 397. Dallas beats people that can't win games. So now, last week we talked about this. Why would an 8 and 3 San Francisco team? Be a two and a half point favorite on the road at 10 and one Philadelphia. And I tried to tell you it's because there was no jeopardy for Philadelphia. They were two games ahead of San Francisco in the conference, a game and a half ahead of Dallas in the division. So even by losing, their position stays the same. They are still in first place. And they had come out of three really tough games. I think Buffalo, Dallas, Kansas City, they'd won them all. So I thought, and maybe you thought too, there could have been a letdown. Yeah, I, you know, Tony, yes. I, I don't disagree with you on anything you said there, except you skipped the part where that great San Francisco juggernaut lost three games in a row a few weeks yes, ago. Yes, puzzling. So I'm not going to crown them yet to steal a phrase from the late, great Dennis Green. I'm not going to crown them. And I'm not going to crown Kansas City, and we'll get to them in a second, like everybody else who's on any network or has a cell phone wants to do, is to crown them now. Things happen. You are absolutely right about San Francisco's offense. It looks like the offense of Montana slash Young, Rice, Taylor, Roger Craig, yep. who was the tight end yep. I'm missing on that, and Rathman. Oh, my God. It looks like that with Bill Walsh at the helm. It does. And, Tony, they didn't win every year. They won a few. They didn't win all the time. Let's see where this goes. For Philly, just for okay. a second, I think this may work in Philly's favor in that now they got to pay attention. If Philadelphia is more than just arrogant, if they are really, truly stubborn in a way that benefits you in sports, they went to practice today angry, and they will stay that way until the playoffs if they are no more than, if they are something more than just a phony angry, a phony the arrogant 49ers, The 49ers tight end was Brent Jones. Brent Jones, thank you. And... Samuel and Trent Williams missed those three games that they lost where Purdy wasn't any good. They are 9-0 and when those two guys are on the squad. And in those nine games, Mike, they have scored 30 or more eight times and 27 the other times. So they may be the secret sauce. We move now to the Green Bay Packers beating Kansas City, who you can't stand, in Lambeau last night and getting their record to 6-6, six and six, which is playoff ready in the NFC. There was a questionable pass interference non-call in the final minute that could have given Kansas City the ball on the six-yard line. Will Bob, did this result tell you more about the Chiefs or the Packers? Six weeks into an NFL season. I hate them. Are we, are we, are we clear now on who I hate sure. and find loathsome? That's who I hate. So, I also am not fond of the person who allows the greatest quarterback of all time, I'm told by some people, including you. I'm not fond of a guy who limits him to 19 points and limits him every week. And you can check the criticism I've made on him running the Kansas well, City offense. That would who, be who Matt Nagy. Who are you Nagy, talking about? To okay, be just, specific, just put it out okay? There. So put it out there. the right. Packers, Jordan Love and the Packers are coming. And I think they're going to make right. the playoffs and they could be a really tough out. In Kansas City, anybody want to crown them right now? Because they got some losses too. I think they have four. 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 They have four. Okay. Right. So I think it says more about the Packers, and I'm one of those people who thought the Packers were done this year, and I'm one of those people who thought Jordan Love wasn't any good. And I can see that I very well may have been wrong, and that when they went up to the first round to draft him, even though Aaron Rodgers was still playing and still healthy, and I thought that was a bad idea, maybe it isn't. Maybe he follows in the line of Favre and Rodgers and Love. Maybe he does, because he outplayed Mahomes last night. He had three touchdown passes. He had no interceptions. In the three-game winning streak that they're on, He's got eight touchdown passes and no interceptions. So one of the good things about being on the show is to be able to say, I think I might have been wrong about that. Now, in terms of and another thing, you think that all coaches in the NFL stink. Um, Matt LaFleur at the moment is 16-0 and in December. He ain't that good in January and February, but he's 16-0 and in December. 
I don't think it's time to panic about the Chiefs for this reason, Mike, because I've seen them and you've seen them win a couple of Super Bowls in the past few years with essentially this crew. Um, I, I think that it's an interconference or a non-conference road game. Maybe it didn't matter that much to them. Maybe they don't care about being dominant in the regular season. Maybe they're going to depend on muscle memory in the playoffs. And my feeling about Mahomes is I give him the better for the of the doubt because I've seen him win all the important games a couple yeah. of times. It's not Mahomes so, I'm doubting. Know, I, I'm, it's not Mahomes oh, I'm doubting. Oh, okay. my, my doubt is specifically right. aimed. Did the arrow not yeah. reach the right fanny? No. So, so then I guess you would blame him. That Taylor Swift, who was 4-0 and in games she sat in on, is now 4-1. and Let's take a break. Coming up, was the Texans' win over the Broncos a tale of two quarterbacks, or was it something more? And how should Ohio State feel that Kyle McCord is entering the transfer portal? Yeah, I, I, you didn't weigh in on that Kansas City. 19 points. 19 points for the greatest quarterback of all time. How's that working out? I just don't think that... You have to worry about them yet. Okay. Not yet. All right. Pardon the interview. Time to find out what's on the minds of the minions. Let me get the first Bill one Clyde. here. Separated from the second one. Did you see the Texans win over the Broncos as a tale of two quarterbacks? No, Tony. I know it would be able to, to do that. Like, I mean, you and I were going back and forth on this, and this was a referendum on for us personally on whether we let Russ cook or make him take the apron off. And he had the three picks, but Tony, he also had a chance to win that game late. I I'm going to give some credit to the defense of the Houston Texans, which made some terrific plays. I mean, the Rook quarterback, I mean, he's still wondrous, but he, he wasn't as great yesterday as he's been. How about that Houston defense, Tony? They've made smart yeah. decisions all over the field with personnel starting front office and coach, head coach. But they've also made some decisions that helped that defense along. They're pretty damn good. Yeah, Russell Wilson was bad yesterday. He had three interceptions all in the second half. He had 186 yards passing, and Stroud had almost 100 yards more than him. But I don't want to make it about quarterbacks, and I'm not going to make it just about Houston's defense. I want to make it about Houston because there are surprising teams in the league this year. Indianapolis is surprising. Green Bay is surprising. Denver is certainly surprising after the way that they started. But Houston is the most surprising, Mike. I agree with you. Houston, here are their you, last three years. 3-13-1, and 4-13, and 4-12. and 12. Nobody would have expected this. They're 7-5, and five, Mike. That's two years worth of wins looking back on the last two years. Yeah. They're going to have the unanimous coach of the year. They're going to have the unanimous rookie of the year. We're watching a team get good yeah. right in front yeah. of our eyes. You told right me, in front of our eyes, You right? wonder if they're ready to have any sort of postseason impact. It might be too early uh, for that, but they, they too look early. In, in the regular season. I'm with you. They are sort of the story of the year in terms yeah. of team success. That's what I think. Yeah. How should Ohio State feel about Kyle McCord entering the transfer portal? They shouldn't even pay attention. They shouldn't even raise an eyebrow. Because everybody enters the transfer portal. Like 50% of the kids on any team at any school are in the transfer portal. Quarterbacks are in the transfer portal. Whether you're a top 10 national university or not, a big state U factory school, all your kids are going in and out of the transfer portal. So Ohio State will find somebody else. I'm trying to think of, it was a team I just read about this morning. I'm forgetting that. I should have taken the note. They have like three quarterbacks in the transfer yeah. portal going in. So Ohio State should feel nothing. They'll lose him to the transfer portal. They'll get somebody really good from the transfer portal. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised to learn that there was almost glee in Ohio State. I mean, the kid is 11-1. and one. He had 24 touchdown passes and six interceptions. He did about everything he could do, except he didn't beat Michigan. But I would think that the people in Ohio State would be a lot happier if Ryan Day went into the transfer <laughs> portal because right. they could blame right. him. For the whole thing. Now, one of the things that you learn in looking at this story is that there's talk that Arch Manning doesn't want to sit behind Quinn Ewers anymore, who, by the way, started at Ohio State, as did Joe Burrow, and found Everybody success somewhere else. Ohio State. That's the point. Yeah, and yeah. so maybe he would go to Ohio State. I mean, that would be interesting to see. You're right about the fact that so many people enter it. But if you're a really good quarterback and you're not starting as a freshman, you're leaving, kids. You're leaving. That's as simple as and, that. And so they'll get somebody else's unhappy quarterback who's That's not happy right. about not starting there. 
Let's take one last break. Still to come, another loss for Bill Belichick and the Patriots. They are awful, it's Mike. terrible. We got two elimination games tonight in that NBA in-season tournament. I guess I got to start to pay attention. Ohio State passed on Joe Burrow. How'd that work out? Ah. Happy time, people. Happy 31st birthday, Blake Snell. How odd that Snell has two Cy Young Awards and has only made one All-Star game. His All-Star game was in 2018 when Snell won his first Cy with Tampa Bay. Snell led the American League in wins 21 and an ERA 189. He won his second Cy this past season in San Diego, leading the majors in ERA 225. Snell went 14 and nine for the Padres, pitched 180 innings, had a ton of walks, 99, and a ton of strikeouts, 234. Snell was a first round draft choice by the Rays in 2011. And as we have often referenced, was pulled from game six of the World Series Ugh. by Kevin Cash while pitching a two hit shutout. Ugh. Snell is a free agent. Somebody's gonna pay him a ton of money, Mike. Yes, Tony, it would seem there's not enough talk about Snell being so valuable that a team should go out and, and reconstruct whatever it needs to in terms of salary to get Blake Snell. He can anchor your rotation. Oh, wait, baseball doesn't care about starting pitching anymore. Happy anniversary, Reggie Roby. This is posthumous, but on this day 26 years ago, the six foot four, 250 pound Pro Bowl punter for the Oilers executed this impressive fake punt against the Bengals. Roby was named the punter on the NFL's all-decade team of the 80s. He was famous for wearing a watch so he could keep track of his own hang time on his punts. Roby played some quarterback in high school in Iowa. He was good enough pitcher to be drafted by the Cincinnati Reds. In 2009, while wearing Houston Oilers throwback uniforms, the Tennessee Titans paid tribute to Roby by calling the same fake punt in the Hall of Fame game in Canton, and it went for a 40-yard touchdown. Yeah, I don't know if that guy could get the extension. Do you see the extension on Roby? I remember starting to yeah. watch him when he was at Iowa, the University of Iowa, punting in the Big Ten, just thinking, wow, this is a Sunday player playing on Saturday, and he certainly was that time. Happy trails to Jim Leland's wait to get into the Hall of Fame, the popular manager who guided the Florida Marlins to the 1997 World Championship was selected for Cooperstown yesterday by what is essentially an old-timers committee examining the careers of managers, umpires, and executives. To get in, you need to be named on at least 12 of the 16 ballots. Leland was named on 15. Falling just short was Lou Pinella, named on 11 ballots. Leland, 78, will be the first manager inducted since 2014 when Joe Torre, Bobby Cox, and Tony La Russa were enshrined. Leland managed the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Marlins, Colorado Rockies, and the Detroit Tigers. He won 1,769 games in 22 years, and he was named Manager of the Year three times, and he managed the Marlins and the Tigers to three pennants. Tony, I'm glad that committee, which functions essentially as a safety net, got it right with Jim Leland. But come on now with sweet Lou Pinella. I mean, next, whatever's next, Lou Pinella ought to go in next by, you know, compliments of that committee. I certainly hope so. I like that they have these committees. Me too. And I like that they're small committees, you know, that not 87 votes, 16 totally and agree. how many you get named on is fine. I, I think I agree with you about Pinella, but a lot of it with Pinella for me was as a hitter, as a player in the league. You know that, that Leland never played in the league. He right. never got out of the minors. Right. And of course he was a catcher because everybody who becomes a great manager seems was to a be a catcher at some, at some point. point sweet Lou, put yeah. him in. Free Lou. Yeah. Maybe the next time. All right, let's go to the big finish. Let's do it. Scotty Scheffler won the Hero World Challenge. Do you find that significant? Yeah, significant. I was playing more attention, paying more attention, like you, to Tiger, who finished 18th of 20. I, I was. The Mariners traded Jared Kelman to the Braves. You surprised by that? He's been a great prospect who hasn't actually delivered. They're cutting salary. Maybe they want yeah. Otani. What do you think? Yeah. Women's hoops. Um, number 11, UConn, lost. I got to get the prompter up with me. To number 10, Texas is now 4-3. and three. Your thoughts? It's a long season, but UConn's struggling right now. So is Duke men, men's team. 5-3, and three, ranked. Come on now. The Chargers beat the Patriots 6-0. Your takeaway? They have no offense. Doesn't matter who the quarterback is. They held teams to 10 points or fewer the last three games, and they lost because they scored 6-7-0. It's a disaster. 
Last one in season tournament quarters tonight Celtics Pacers, Pelicans King 3 go. If Halliburton plays, I will take the Pacers, even though the Celtics are the best team in the league. And I'm taking Sacramento to light the beam, Tony. Those are the two teams I got tonight. We're out of time. We will try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. And now to get you set for Monday Night Football, here's Scott Van Pelt and the Countdown Crew. And we have to linger. You should have given it more. You know, now we're going to.